Welcome to the sequel of the ambassadorial series, Deans of US-Russia Diplomacy. I'm Hannah Notte. No decade was more decisive for shaping post-Cold War US-Russia relations than the fateful 1990s. Who can claim to have a more unique and intimate perspective of the forces that shaped this relationship than United States ambassadors to Russia? Jack Matlock, Thomas Pickering and James Collins served as US ambassadors to Moscow. From the disintegration of the Soviet Union in 1991 to President Putin's ascent to power a decade later, they were eyewitnesses to Russia's tremendous transformation after the fall of the Iron Curtain. They were also actors in that history. They met and negotiated with the highest Russian officials, traveled throughout the country, interacted with Russian citizens. In this sequel to the ambassadorial series, we will learn from three deans of US-Russia diplomacy. They will share their personal experiences in navigating the challenges in the US-Russia relationship during the 1990s, Russian domestic upheavals and regional and international developments that would come to trouble the relationship. And we will take a step back from those events to reflect on missed opportunities, ways forward, and recipes for successful US-Russia diplomacy. Schultz stood up other side of the table, put out his hands. And as they shook hands, Schultz said, Edward, let me assure you, I will never ask you to do something that I do not think is in your country's interest. I had trouble keeping the tears back. I was at the table watching the, the Cold War was over for those two. Welcome to part two of our conversation with Ambassador Jack Matlock. In this second part of our conversation, we look at important aspects of US-Russia diplomacy over time. The role of cultural understanding, the fallacy of viewing dialogue as a reward, the role of individual leaders, the complex process of US foreign policy making vis-a-vis -vis Russia, and much more. Ambassador Matlock, um, your books do a fantastic job bringing to life American-Soviet diplomacy under Reagan and Gorbachev. And you conclude that these two individuals were really instrumental in shaping the trajectories of events at the time. In fact, you write that it is difficult to imagine how the Cold War could have ended when and as it did if both Reagan and Gorbachev hadn't been in office at, that, at the same time. And I generally notice that you touch upon the significance of individuals rather frequently in your books. At one point, you even cite George Kennan as having said that at the bottom of all human experience, there lies after all the mystery of the individual personality, its ultimate autonomy of decision, its interaction with the mass. But at the same time, you also point to the problem of bureaucratic inertia of systems and structures adapting slowly to new circumstances, like after the end of the Cold War. And, you know, I feel that we're confronted with this question about the individual versus structure quite often when we're thinking about today's Russia because serious scholars often criticize the use of the term Putin's Russia as being really too simplistic to capture the reality of contemporary Russia, but then others contend that there really can't be any meaningful change in Russia's domestic or foreign policy while the individual Putin is in power. So what is your take on this question on the relative weight between the individual and structural forces in shaping events? Well, first of all, I would say, uh, referring to um, one of your latter statements, the people who say that there could be no change in uh, Russia as long as Putin is in power, I would say that I grew up and learned about the Soviet Union when most were convinced there could be no change in the Soviet Union as long as the Communist Party was in power. They were wrong. Now, all right, let's go back to the original question. You know, when you ask about 
in the abstract about, you know, uh, the, you might say the hero in history. Obviously, there are things or circumstances that probably uh, very much mitigate against change. I know one of my history professors who was talking about this theory said, you know, uh, Bismarck, you know, is credited with, in effect, unifying many of the German-speaking states uh, to the, the German uh, state uh, under the leadership of Prussia. But he said, well, and you can say, well, he was a great man uh, because when he stopped guiding it, things really went very, very wrong. Uh, but he said, well, but suppose Bismarck had been born in Portugal. It's not that an individual, if he or she is strong enough or so on, that they necessarily are going to be able to change things. The reason I said that we were lucky that Gorbachev and Reagan were in office at the same time was because each of them did things that others in their party that might have been um, elected or selected at that time would not have done. Now, there were plenty of Democrats that could have negotiated the arms control treaties, but they could not have gotten them ratified in the American Senate. And of course, one of the reasons these things were successful was that Gorbachev changed Soviet policy. And he changed it using the authority uh, that he had as the uh, general secretary of the Communist Party. And then having changed the foreign policy and brought about uh, an end to the arms race, uh, he began to use that authority uh, to institute reforms. Now, I don't th think there was another plausible general secretary uh, at the time he became general secretary who would have done that. So uh, that's why I say having those two individuals in the offices they had uh, created something that, as we have already talked about, uh, nobody predicted. Uh, because in both cases, uh, they were acting in a way that perhaps others could not have done. In Reagan's case, it was not that there weren't other leaders that could have negotiated these agreements. Uh, but the fact that given the American politics, they would have been very hard getting uh, sufficient votes in the Senate to ratify them. So the fact that it was Ronald Reagan, who really could not be outflanked from the right, who expounded and backed these things, the INF Treaty lost six votes in the Senate, all of them Republicans. And if you hadn't had Reagan, that same treaty would not have gone through the American uh, Senate. So uh, that's why I say in those cases, yes, I think that uh, the individuals make a difference. It doesn't mean that they can, that uh, an individual can overcome circumstances. And sometimes circumstances are perhaps overwhelming. And yes, uh, part of, of getting things done uh, is being able to maneuver and convince enough people on your side, given whatever the political situation is. In this respect, I might say, those with systems that are more authoritarian can often be more effective in foreign policy. Uh, and uh, uh, so I very much uh, dislike the attempt today to say, well, some are more authoritarian than others. Well, that's true. And yet, it, particularly in a very divided society, sometimes you need an authoritarian streak, at least, to get anything done. Uh, and so uh, I think that we need to put all of these things in context, because the political leaders don't operate in a vacuum or in a, you know, you might say a level playing field. There are always obstacles. Uh, there will always, if you are, if you are a, a leader trying to bring about change, particularly in your own society, this is probably the most difficult task at all. And uh, uh, therefore, uh, the uh, it, it seems to me that um, uh, well, let's take an American example. 
uh, Lyndon Johnson and human rights. Uh, the fact that he was from Texas, was a Southerner, enabled him to do things that other American presidents didn't go. Now, if he hadn't gotten uh, us deeply involved in the Vietnam War, he would probably go down as one of our greatest presidents because of what he was able to do domestically. And you might say, well, there were plenty of Northern liberal Democrats who wanted to do these things, but could they have accomplished them? It really took a Lyndon Johnson to accomplish them. So, and was he a perfect person? Did everything he do praiseworthy? No, <laughs> absolutely not. But I think we, again, when we are judging individual leaders and looking at the past, we have to put them in context. And uh, uh, because they were operating in context. Thank you so much for these uh, reflections, Ambassador Matlock. Um, there is an anecdote that you tell in your book, Superpower Illusions, which I really appreciated. It's this anecdote about a meeting that you attended in Soviet-occupied Latvia in 1986. And in fact, there were frictions at the time between the US government and the Soviet Union. You still ended up going to that meeting in Latvia, even though some of your American colleagues criticized you for it. And you write in your book, and I quote you here, refusing to talk to an adversary is like turning into a dead end street. And that it's basically a fallacy to confuse communication with appeasement or let alone capitulation. But you know, today it seems to me there's this widespread notion that our relations with Russia are so bad that one shouldn't quote unquote, reward Putin with dialogue. Now, from your experience, why is this a mistaken notion? And what would you say to those who argue, and I think there are frequently people today who argue this, you know, that dialogue and summits with Russia have in recent years really turned into this ceremonial, almost ritualized expositions of the two sides, the two parties' well-known positions, These positions are often incompatible. And so, you know, there's really no point to these summits and to these meetings. Well, yes, I, it seems to me that if there is a problem, you have to communicate and you have to be willing to listen to the other side and not just barrel ahead, assuming that everything you do is perfect. That's going to simply exacerbate the situation. It doesn't help a thing. Uh, now, uh, going back to you know, the situation that we had then, we had planned a, a meeting, um, a continuation of some of the meetings that we had had at Chautauqua, New York, uh, and we wanted to hold one in the Soviet Union. And this had been worked out with Uh, Anatoly Dobrynin, who was then the Soviet ambassador in Washington. And he had been then transferred to Moscow and was working in the Communist Party Central Committee. The idea was that we would have a, a very frank debate. Uh, and certainly we had a, a, an American delegation uh, among, well, I would say, some of our, our most... Um, Uh, uh, well, some of our most hawkish uh, members. And we said, you know, we really want to explain clearly uh, the, our position and debate it with them and openly. And we were assured that we would be given television coverage in the entire country and that the, the proceedings uh, would be uh, televised in full uh, in uh, Uh, in Latvia. Now, there were people who said, oh, we shouldn't go because we don't recognize the Soviet uh, uh, occupation of Latvia. And uh, my position was, uh, uh, of course, we should go. And I can explain that we don't recognize that uh, Latvia is legally uh, a part of the Soviet Union. Uh, I knew that so many Latvians, like Lithuanians and Estonians, were worried that we simply considered them Russians. Uh, and I thought, well, we can, we can certainly uh, 
show them that we have an interest in, and I'll even start my speech with a few paragraphs in the Latvian language, uh, and then finish the rest in the Russian language, which uh, I could express myself uh, more, more adequately. Uh, now, it happened that at that time, uh, we were in one of these spats about spies. We had arrested uh, a, um, a Soviet citizen who worked for the United Nations, who uh, was uh, uh, caught in espionage, and he did not have diplomatic immunity. So uh, in uh, response, the Soviets arrested an American journalist who was not a spy, but also didn't have diplomatic immunity. And so we were having this big controversy over the arrest of Nicholas Denilov. And uh, his wife went on television and others said, oh, we shouldn't hold this conference. We shouldn't reward them uh, as long as they were holding Danilov. Well, it seemed to me that, you know, staying away from that conference was certainly not going to bring any pressure on the Soviet Union. And the opportunity to put our case on television before the Soviet people, I thought was a very important one. But this became so politically charged at home. I know some of the, uh, uh, on the Friday evening before we were to leave, uh, one, of the, uh, uh, one of the journalists who was very popular was saying, well, this White House official Jack Matlock is violating, you know, is going to violate our non-recognition things by actually going to Latvia, even though Danilov is still being held. Well, <laughs> um, you know, I, I was working then on the National Security Council staff, and uh, I called the assistant to George Schultz, the Secretary of State, and said, well, does the Secretary want me to go or not? And he called back to said, the secretary said, you're a grown man, make up your mind. And so then I asked the national security advisor and uh, to check with the president, Don Poindexter was then advisor. He did and he said, well, the president thinks you ought to go. We need to communicate. And I said, well, that's good enough for me. And you know, uh, as I said, one of the first statements I made was that we do not recognize the legality of the inclusion of Latvia, Estonia, and Lithuania uh, in the Soviet Union. Later, you know, these meetings continued at Chautauqua in New York, and after the Soviet Union broke up, one of the leaders of the Latvian independence movement said, that's what gave us the start. We really most people didn't know that that was your policy. But if you didn't recognize, we had a chance. And so this really, really began to fuel uh, the independence movement in Latvia. So the idea, and I would say that some of the harder line members of our delegation refused to go. Well, we're not going to go there while they're holding down law. <laughs> you know, you're cutting off your nose to spite your face, in effect, because uh, these, uh, it is really necessary. So, but the idea that you're somehow rewarding somebody else because you talk to them is, I think, quite mistaken. Among other things, it, it indicates that you're not willing to deal with them as equals. You're not willing to deal with them to respect. Uh, I think, in general, uh, that is the opposite of what it should be. And I'll go back, you know, I remember one of the things that President Reagan used to say, it was in, at one point, he said, uh, and regarding our dealings with the Soviet Union, this is uh, when things were still tense, he said, we've got to start, we've got to stop talking about each other so much and talk to each other more. But it wasn't just a matter of talking to each other, it was also, you got to learn to listen to try to understand the other point of view. And uh, so, and it's not that there's a magic in summit meetings. Uh, you, both sides, if they're going to have them, used to be they want to be able to come back and say they achieved something important. But, uh, and, but uh, the fact is, if you are meeting, 
normally the your staffs are going to be instructed to try to agree on as much as you can and then to narrow the things they discuss to some of the key issues and uh, this can be important i've never thought that it was useful to exclude others uh, because of their policies uh, from uh, negotiation because that just uh, motivates them to be even more trouble uh, because they've got no incentive really to um, uh, to listen to you if you're not even going to talk to them. Fascinating. Thank you for sharing that story with us and this notion of listening. I'll come back to in another question a bit later. Um, right now, I want to ask you about something else. Um, in your books, you draw attention a few times to diplomatic episodes where issues had to be handled quietly, privately. For yeah. example, when a Soviet defector provided the United States intelligence, I believe in 1989, uh, with some intel on the ongoing existence of a Soviet biological weapons program, even though the USSR had signed and ratified uh, the Biological Weapons Convention. Ambassador Matlock, why is it sometimes so important to address things in private, in diplomacy? Come to some pertinent examples from your own career. And I also want to ask you this. Is such an approach of handling things delicately, quietly, still possible today in diplomacy? In our age of ubiquitous social media coverage and this demand by our publics, for unconditional transparency from the political leadership? I think that there are times when if you're going to reach agreement, it really has to be uh, developed in private uh, because usually on both sides, there are so many vested interests that if you get too public, you're going to have really major um, problems in, uh, in solving it. Uh, now, uh, you referred to uh, an instance when uh, we discovered because of defectors uh, that we were absolutely sure that there was a Soviet uh, biological warfare program still uh, in violation of, of their treaty obligations. And uh, this we found out in a, jointly with the British. And so the British ambassador and I were instructed to go uh, to um, the foreign minister and to Gorbachev's advisor um, and simply say, look, we have this information, close it. Because we don't, you know, if we get into a big public hassle over that, over this, uh, it's going to be very hard to solve. Uh, we were then negotiating almost uh, ready for the um, strategic arms treaty. It was when it was the uh, build up to the war, the Gulf War, where we needed their support in uh, the UN. Uh, the Soviet Union itself was beginning to fall apart. We were, had so many things on there. We don't need, you know, a public issue over that. And well, to make a long story short, uh, um, uh, Gorbachev, first of all, his own people had misled uh, and lied to most of theirs. We were told later uh, that Shevardnadze, the foreign minister, had never been told that they had the program, although they suspected it because we uh, were constantly complaining. But, uh, but people would come from the program and deny uh, that they were doing anything illegal. Uh, and uh, so uh, the... Uh, what we got then was a request to, we both had acknowledged, well, uh, pro programs, uh, defensive programs. And by the way, a specialist can easily distinguish an offensive from a defensive program from the type of equipment you have. So they asked uh, if we uh, would uh, have an exchange of specialists who would look at the suspect facilities. And the first reaction I got from the United States was, no way, we don't have any problems here and why are they asking for this? And I said, look, we should accept that because I'm sure they have told their people that they are doing it because we are doing it. And since we are not doing it, let's let them see that. Well, 
that happened. And uh, what, the number two in the program, uh, their program was there. He later defected and wrote a book. Uh, his name is Ali Bekov. He wrote a book about the program and said that genuinely he had thought we had one until he went there and, and actually saw that we didn't. Uh, and that uh, therefore they started, you know, closing things down. Uh, but the bureaucracy was such we couldn't be sure that they would even follow Gorbachev's order to close it down. That was one of the problems in the uh, the, the Soviet Union, that the, the KGB, many elements of the military and the other were not completely under control of the leader. Uh, uh, but uh, so this was an example of, of a very serious problem uh, that it was much easier to dissolve. Now, and I would even go back to the Cuban Missile Crisis. The deal that ended uh, that, ended that which was not announced at the time, was uh, one uh, that uh, uh, if the Soviets would remove their nuclear missiles from Cuba, we would later remove the ones we had put in Turkey. After all, we had been the first to deploy intermediate range missiles that could hit the Soviet Union. And now part of that deal was this would not be announced. So, uh, but Khrushchev accepted that. And I would say even those of us in Moscow did not know about that deal. The fact was uh, we agreed uh, uh, in effect to remove them. And that was done by what they call the back channel. Um, uh, Kennedy's brother, uh, who was an attorney general was dealing uh, with the KGB resident in Washington. And by the way, we generally knew who was running uh, the spy agency in uh, our capital, and, and these communications were sometimes used. Um, and as a matter of fact, we had rather regular consultations between the uh, CIA and, and the KGB in Vienna about uh, issues to try to uh, dim down uh, misunderstandings. Uh, but uh, uh, the point is that sometimes, if issues are extremely delicate, uh, you, uh, you, you really need to talk about them uh, privately. Uh, I was getting, you know, signals uh, uh, all, the, all the time earlier when I was in charge of the American uh, Embassy in Moscow and before I was an ambassador. Uh, that they wanted sort of a back channel uh, to discuss things like arms control. Uh, and we would offer them sometimes uh, uh, that uh, in certain issues. Uh, these were particularly useful when you're dealing with an issue where our domestic uh, special interests are so powerful that if you, if you go public before you have a deal which you can defend, uh, they'll do everything they can to block it. Uh, so, uh, you know, thinking about this issue in general, I recall that one of the principles that uh, uh, President Wilson, Woodrow Wilson, enunciated in uh, the 90s was that, uh, that, uh, uh, that there should be uh, open conventions openly arrived at. Uh, my professor of international relations at Columbia, uh, Philip Mosley, said he got it wrong. We need open conventions secretly arrived at because if every negotiation is totally open, you'll probably never get anywhere because of a vested interests on both sides who will wreck it if they think their own parochial interests are being affected. And so you think these delicate negotiations are still possible today to the same extent that perhaps they were possible during the Cold War? Well, they're not possible if your public image is one uh, attacking and personally denigrating the other leader. This is something that I, I, I do not understand how intelligent, well-meaning uh, people can allow international relations get into sort of a personal uh, battle. 
Um, now, Ronald Reagan very famously called the Soviet Union an evil empire. And he was unsparing in his criticisms of communism. He never once denigrated an individual Soviet leader. And when he would meet them, uh, his first words were usually, we hold the peace of the world in our hands. We must operate responsibly. And even though, you know, we thought of Andre Gromyko as Mr. Nyet and so on, he was given full honors at the White House, treated virtually as a chief of state uh, with formal dinners and so on. And I would say, well, this is one of the differences uh, President Reagan had uh, from many other uh, uh, leaders is, and maybe it was because he was trained as an actor. After all, he was trained to put himself in the shoes of other people. And what interested him in our briefings before he met uh, the Soviet leaders was not so much the details of arms control or these other issues. Uh, frankly, he would often doze off if you get into too much detail on that. What he concentrated on was, who is this fellow Gorbachev? Where is he coming from? How can we establish more trust between us? And I would say he was person and he understood, yes, he's not a dictator. He's got a Politburo. And therefore, you know, he's going to be a tough negotiator. Uh, and in a sense, he had what we would call empathy, which is different from sympathy. He really wanted to understand where the other person was coming from. Now, if, if that's the case, then simply to demonize another leader, uh, as has been done both by the media and unfortunately our own political leaders uh, with President Putin, uh, I think is, uh, is a, simply a, a no-win sort of thing. You don't achieve one thing from that. Now, that, that's not a defense of anything that President Putin has done. But the fact is, you're not going to get anywhere dealing with these problems unless you deal with them with a certain respect. And we should recognize that he brought Russia out of bankruptcy. He brought them out of chaos. And we might not like some of the things, but the Russians still have the right to travel abroad, the right to travel internally, things that were extremely constricting uh, with the Soviet Union. But to act as if nothing has changed again is simply, uh, I, I think, wrong. So that um, the, uh, uh, I think th uh, that it's very clear if you get anywhere, you, uh, you have to uh, treat your interlocutor uh, uh, with personal respect. It doesn't mean you've got to praise them or so on, after all, uh, who authorize us to hand out report cards on leaders of other countries. I mean, that shouldn't be. I mean, we may have our opinions and our, you know, our, our media, our uh, non-governmental organizations certainly should express opinions. But as far as uh, the president and uh, the U.S. government, uh, we need to keep a, uh, I would say, a respect, uh, respect uh, uh, we need to deal with other leaders with a certain respect and not get into uh, uh, personal uh, accusations uh, or, uh, or for that matter, defenses. Um, Ambassador Matlock, your reflections just now on the importance of empathy are a perfect segue to my next question, which is about the importance of Russian culture. So your own path to becoming a distinguished diplomat serving your country in Russia and its neighborhood started with a passion for the Russian language and for Russian literature. And that passion gave you an important window into understanding your interlocutors in Russia, gave you an appreciation for Russian culture, and you emphasize the importance of culture also quite frequently in your books. Culture, but also related notions like social norms, ideology, concepts of honor and prestige for developing empathy for the other side. So I'd like to ask you, can you reflect a little bit on instances of 
American practice of what we might call diplomacy of empathy versus diplomacy of imposition and how an understanding for culture can make us better diplomats of empathy. Yes, well, I think that um, one of the jobs of, uh, of a diplomat is to understand and uh, the country to which he or she is assigned and to convey that understanding back to uh, their own governments. Um, I would say when I was teaching courses on diplomacy, you know, a diplomat is uh, the eyes, ears, and voice of his government. I would say government rather than country because it's the government you're representing. You're specifically representing the president uh, in the case of American diplomats. So uh, in another country. Now, obviously, the more you know about uh, uh, the local culture, uh, uh, including the language, the history, uh, the uh, the uh, economic conditions, uh, social structure, etc. All of these things, the better you are able to assess uh, what goes on. That's far more important than spies or uh, intelligence. Intelligence is important if you want to know precisely how many weapons they have and uh, and what the capabilities are. But as far as politics, by far, uh, to understand the country and its policies, uh, one really uh, needs to know the society and if possible, if conditions uh, allow, to know personally uh, the leaders who make that policy. Uh, so uh, it seems to me this is just axiomatic. Now, Having said that, uh, as far as uh, a government is concerned, a lot depends upon how you use your ambassadors. If the ambassadors are are are, are simply uh, not listened to or consulted in policy making, or if uh, they you know are political appointees that are appointed uh, simply because they made a large contribution. Uh, uh, not all the political appointees are bad ambassadors, I would say. Sometimes they, they can be very good and even knowledgeable about the countries, but often they're not. Uh, but uh, the, the thing is, it is up to uh, the government, the chief of state, the foreign minister, as to how you use the ambassadors. Sometimes you can send them out as a political reward and simply ignore them. Um, and um, Or, as I said, I was incredibly lucky, having worked directly with President Reagan before he sent me as ambassador, and also knowing very well Vice President Bush, who then became ambassadors. So I was in an ideal position that I knew them, they knew me, they consulted me, we were able to work together in a way that quite honestly, it's fairly rare among uh, diplomats and uh, governments, I would say, rather than diplomats. But certainly, uh, I was able to do my job better uh, because I was able to, in effect, immerse myself in uh, Soviet culture. And I say Soviet because I paid as much attention uh, to the non-Russian republics as I did uh, uh, to Russia. But also, and I think this in my case was extremely important, the fact that I was genuinely interested in, in Russian culture, that I could read the literature for sheer pleasure. In fact, it's one of the things that has really enriched my life uh, entirely aside from uh, diplomacy. This gave me, I would say, I think uh, an empathy uh, for the country, even when our relationships were um, most difficult. I absolutely hated communism. I did understand it. I thought it was an ideology that had been imposed upon a great people, the Russian people. And I was never, <laughs> I was never one that would uh, 
uh, shirk from uh, debating or uh, telling them when they did something wrong. But, you know, I shortly after I arrived as ambassador, I was asked by a junior um, Soviet diplomat, one who often took notes in my meetings with the foreign minister, uh, he came to a reception, and when he came through the line, he said, I wonder if I could have a word with you later. And I said, well, sure. And when we had greeted the other guests, I took him aside and said, what's on your mind? And he said, uh, i got a question for you. Okay. And he said, you know, you can come in and you can say things to my boss that if anybody else said them, he would climb the walls in fury. But from you, he takes it. What's your secret? I had not been asked that question before, but I thought a minute and I said, you know, basically, I think he senses that I love this country and I hate what has happened to it. And I have to express that. And he said, I thought that was true. And I wondered if you understood it, which is one of the most memorable conversations I had because basically it was true. I mean, I, I felt a great, you know, attraction to the cultural depth of the Russian theater, of Russian literature. I was fully aware of all of the, I would say, the horrors of Stalinism and, and the imposed ideology. And I knew that uh, this was not the real Russia that I knew. Uh, so that I think that, um, I th and I think this was sensed also as a matter of public relations. You know, when I was able to, when they gave me access to television and um, uh, actually after Gorbachev began to open up the country from, particularly from 1989 on, uh, I had many interviews, sometimes on national television. One of them ran for an hour. Uh, and um, the, the thing is that most, the, the Soviet people were not that interested in discussing details of arms control or other political issues. They wanted to know uh, which poets I had translated, uh, which writers I was most interested in, and be, being able to discuss at a reasonable uh, level their own culture, their own literature, conveyed an Im image not of a threatening country, which is an enemy, but of one that really was interested in them and cared about them and was certainly not going to go to war. Uh, so this is obviously things that we didn't talk about directly that often. But I do think that uh, the ability to communicate uh, on the same grounds as as uh, the people's culture. The other thing was that when there were changes, I was able, I think, and my staff, I, I will have to say, I think these things I'm talking about apply to many on our staff. I had one of the greatest staffs that has ever been assembled at, I think, any embassy, and <laughs> we're not just American ones. Uh, you know, our staff, they were, they, they knew Russian, many of them knew, knew other languages of the Soviet Union. They kept it, they traveled, they kept in touch. Uh, and um, they, they, so I think that uh, we were able to understand what was going on in the country. And as I may have already mentioned, uh, I believe later, even better than Gorbachev understood. Uh, because we did have contacts, we did have, as I said, some rapport uh, with the people, even if we were sort of at opposite ends of policy issues. Uh, we could explain, we could try to find a way uh, that would uh, satisfy both sides. I would add, as I'm talking about this, that yes, this is important. But for diplomacy, you also have to know your own country. And uh, that's one thing that sometimes people ignore. Uh, you, you need to know, you know, uh, the attitudes of the people in your bureaucracy and others uh, in order to select the, the best arguments. 
as I've often said when I was working, I would always make a recommendation I thought was uh, uh, the, the correct one. But if I were explaining it to Henry Kissinger, it would be a different explanation than if I was explaining it to Cyrus Vance, for example, to name uh, two different uh, secretaries of state. Because by understanding where they come from, you can help to place this within their scheme of attention and values and defend it uh, uh, from that standpoint. So it's, it's a matter of, of balancing. I think it is also a matter of, uh, of being absolutely truthful. Uh, there is this old um, <laughs> halfway joke about the uh, British ambassador who was going off to be ambassador, I think, uh, in Turkey to the Ottoman Empire. And he stopped at a friend in, in uh, Western Europe on the way and wrote in the Gus book in Latin uh, that uh, uh, an ambassador is an honest man who goes abroad uh, to lie for his country. Now, this was a double entendre because the, the uh, instructions at that time uh, to a foreign ruler was that one sovereign was sending a representative, uh, an ambassador to represent him to lie near you, meaning to live near you. Uh, but uh, this became to lie abroad for his country. And uh, my answer to that was, in my opinion, effective diplomacy uh, is, uh, must be truthful. And there is only one permissible lie, which is, I don't know. Now, there are things that obviously, because of your secrecy rules, you, you can't discuss directly. And we all understand that. And if, but you don't say something to mislead. And, and, um, uh, and I think that's a, a true effective diplomacy. So the idea that you're sent abroad to trick other people, uh, or as some have said, well, you, know, you say nice doggy until you can pick up a stick. No, that is not diplomacy. Um, uh, I think it has to be uh, absolutely frank. And, and I think it is entirely possible to oppose certain policies quite vigorously and argue against them without insulting the other person and without uh, uh, somehow uh, denigrating them personally. Obviously, the people you're dealing with also, the other diplomats they're representing you know, their, their political system, and one has to understand that. Uh, so uh, anyway, one could go on and on about this because there are so many qualities. But I think that for effective diplomacy, you need to make sure you are accurately representing your government. If you have disagreements about policy, you should be able to let your government know, but not anybody else. In other words, once the president or the secretary of state decides what the policy is going to be, you must try to execute that faithfully. Uh, that's also part of it. Uh, so uh, there are so many factors here. And I would say very often, uh, uh, very often uh, governments, particularly American governments, don't make full use of their diplomats. I think we have one of the finest diplomatic services in the world, or at least we had until very recently when uh, it has taken a number of blows. Uh, but, and, uh, and it, more often than not, uh, the professionals are either ignored or sidelined. Fascinating, Ambassador Matlock. And I do want to ask a follow-up question on a few important moments uh, that we just touched upon this importance of understanding your own side, your own government. You also mentioned previously, it's important how a government chooses to use its ambassador abroad. So I want to ask you to reflect a little bit about the process of foreign policy making in the US. It appears to be a complex process with a crowded actor landscape. We have the president, the secretary of state, we have an interagency process, Congress, the media, um, who makes foreign policy vis-a-vis -vis Russia? 
And when the Washington bureaucracy is in direct contact with Moscow, which I imagine must happen frequently, then what is the role of the ambassador on the ground? And what are some of the constraints and opportunities within which the ambassador operates? There is among the, the, um, the countries that are most important to, um, uh, to, to their counterparts, you might say, uh, the secretary of state, even the presidents or the prime ministers do a lot of, of direct conversation. Now you can have classified telephone calls, even probably uh, classified calls on uh, the equivalent of of uh, Zoom or Skype. Uh, and so there is much more possibility of the direct contact uh, between uh, the senior people uh, without going through uh, their embassies. Uh, that's, uh, that has changed things a lot. Now, uh, now, but that has several implications. One thing is if your country as the United States really has global interests and has diplomatic and consular representations in virtually all the independent countries in the world, and they're close to 200 now, there is no way in the world that the Secretary of State uh, or uh, the President can take care of more than just a few. I mean, and um, so, and yet, relations with these other countries are extremely important. They, and of course the functions of embassies include a lot of things other than negotiating with the top. Uh, you're protecting American citizens, you, uh, you're promoting American uh, commerce. Uh, you, there, there are many on the ground jobs uh, that uh, uh, require Diplomacy in the sense of knowing the local people, knowing the local things. You know, Americans travel widely, at least before COVID, and uh, they, they do get into trouble elsewhere and the, the consular officer has to deal with that. They lose their passports sometimes. And uh, uh, so we have many reasons. Um, uh, they, there is a, uh, to, have very active and complement diplomatic things other uh, than talking, you know, to the top people. But the thing is, if um, if they rely almost exclusively on that, then they are really missing, uh, uh, I think, the possibility because you really need the people on the spot who day by after day. Uh, co continually, or you might say, are monitoring what is going on, what is going on in the society. And uh, when you do prepare your talking points for these telephone calls, uh, usually that's done by your staff. And the staff, to the degree they can rely upon a, a, an active and knowledgeable embassy, uh, they will uh, prepare these in cooperation with the staff, let the staff know in advance. Uh, often, if you're going to make a speech or if you're going to meet the other leader, you want to alert the staff to, of any new proposals you're making and, 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 and try, to, um, try to make sure you'll get a positive response. Uh, and you can, you know, through diplomatic channels, you can say, look, uh, this particular thing is a no-no here. Can't you emphasize something else? So in other words, there's so all sorts of ways that the staff can, can help guide the leaders when they use them correctly, even though they're having more uh, direct um, uh, uh, contact. On the whole, I think the, the direct contact is good. Uh, and, but I think it can be a problem if a given president or secretary of state uh, think they know it all and really don't need a lot of advice. Uh, and that, that has happened at times. Thank you so much for that. Um, Ambassador Matlock, we have talked a lot about the Soviet period. We've talked about the 1990s. I wanna come to 9-11 as an inflection point. Um, you point out in your books that perhaps after 9-11, there was a chance to change the dynamics of the US-Russia relationship when President Putin decided 
to cooperate with the United States in the so-called uh, global war on terror. But what then followed instead was the US unilateral abrogation of the ABM treaty, the invasion of Iraq in 2003, further NATO eastward expansion and so on and so forth. And then eventually we end up with President Putin's famous 2007 Munich speech and uh, the Russia-Georgia war of 2008. So I want to ask you, do you think there really was a chance in 2001 to set the relationship onto a different trajectory, considering all that had gone wrong in the 1990s already? I think that, uh, yes, I think we would have had a much better relationship if, if our policy had been different uh, uh, during uh, the second Bush administration. I think that uh, uh, continuing to expand NATO, I think was a, a mistake. Uh, I, I think frankly that once we took in um, uh, Czechoslovakia uh, or, and uh, Hungary and Poland, uh, we almost had to include the three Baltic states. And I think uh, uh, Putin reluctantly accepted that. I remember he was asked about it before it happened uh, in a speech in New York. And he said, well, I don't think it's necessary, but it's not, you know, it's in other words, they did understand that as far as the three Baltic countries are concerned, that they, you might say, historically, legally and other things are in a different position from the other uh, countries in the so-called near abroad. Uh, that is the other uh, ex-Soviet republics. Um, but what happened was not only did we continue to expand NATO, not only did we conduct an aggressive war against uh, Iraq uh, without UN sanctions and actually against the opin opinion not only of Russia, but also allies Germany and France. Uh, and uh, at the same time, uh, we were drawing out of arms control treaties, the ABM treaty, which had been, you might say, the anchor of uh, arms reduction uh, with the Soviet Union. Uh, we, uh, we then uh, uh, signed an agreement which uh, was so general, uh, we had no verification, uh, and uh, nor did we uh, destroy those weapons that were taken off alert until we got the New START Treaty in the Obama administration. We, in effect, had walked out of all the verification measures that had taken us decades to negotiate uh, during the Cold War. So I think these were all very serious mistakes. Uh, and uh, then as we began to take the countries in the Balkans uh, into NATO uh, and uh, uh, and then to talk about, and by 2008, actually uh, vote to put uh, Ukraine and Georgia on, you might say, a road to NATO membership. This was crossing a very clear red line. And um, so that I do think that at that time, uh, different policies uh, could have brought about an entirely different result. Now, I would say that if we expected uh, Russia to become a democracy, I'll put that in quotes, with it, that it operates just like it does in the United States, then no, I think that was, uh, that was an impossible dream, at least on the time. So, uh, but, um, and the and frankly, some of our problems developed because clearly we were expressing strong preferences over some factions over others. Uh, we like to talk now about foreign interference in American elections. I would say for several decades, the US interfered whenever it thought its national interests were involved and uh, uh, deterred only by not appearing to do so because they knew that could, uh, uh, could backfire. So this idea that uh, uh, nations shouldn't interfere in the elections of others, well, uh, nations do. 
um, and um, uh, and usually they 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 create more harm for their candidates than uh, support if they do it too openly. But to continue, I would say the speech that President Putin made in Munich listed the problems he had, and I would say, in my opinion, none of those things were necessary to American security. We would have been better off without them. And in general, uh, our, uh, our support for uh, the, our overt support for the so-called color revolutions, I think was, were quite unwise. Now, it's not that the people that were demonstrating did not have valid grievances, they did. But uh, to appear to be uh, trying to support uh, unconstitutional changes, not just influence elections, but trying the overthrow uh, of other governments by a faction that favored us, and in many cases had the goal of <laughs> NATO membership. Uh, I think uh, this became very destructive because one thing, uh, no Russian uh, government could tolerate would be uh, taking uh, uh, countries uh, like Ukraine or Georgia into a, an alliance, a uh, military alliance hostile to Russia. These were, I think, uh, um, very big mistakes. And now, uh, I'm, I think that... Uh, uh, Putin's reaction uh, sometimes have and often have not been in the interests of Russia. So yes, there was a, you might say, uh, uh, a, a mutual uh, escalation. Uh, I do think it started with uh, uh, actions by the United States. I think there was overreaction on the other side. And then the development of a personalization of the problem has only made it uh, uh, more difficult. Uh, but to get back to your question, yes, I think there was a possibility of having, uh, of developing um, much more normal relations, the relations which would not have been a, uh, uh, a Russia with a system precisely like ours. How could that possibly be the case? Two countries with such different history and such different, uh, 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 you might say, geographical locations. After all, we have two oceans separating us from Eurasia, one on each side, uh, whereas Russia is, uh, occupies uh, a very large part of the continent with most of its neighbors uh, uh, along very long land borders. Uh, the situation uh, of the two is quite different. Uh, so I think that, uh, as I had mentioned earlier, uh, the effort uh, that we made, um, a quixotic effort to, quote, support democracy and the methods that we used uh, didn't actually support democracy. Uh, but actually exacerbated problems that developed there uh, and elsewhere in the world. Thank you for that, uh, Ambassador Matlock. I think we have covered a lot of ground in our conversation about the things that didn't go quite right in the relationship over the past decades. I want to come to today. It appears to me sometimes that nowadays Russia uses quote unquote, what aboutism, you know, a criticism of what it sees as US double standards, uh, criticism of past US foreign policy mistakes, almost as a sort of knockout argument to stifle any substantive discussion on any policy issue. I'll give you one example. The moment that you criticize, for instance, Russian policy in Syria, Russian diplomats will make references to the United States mistakes in Iraq in 2003 or in Libya in 2011. And this doesn't always make for the most constructive or, or substantive debate on the actual issue at hand. So I wanna ask you, given all that happened, how do we overcome this vicious cycle 
of both sides constantly dishing up the other side's past policy mistakes. I think there is a way to get away from that. You know, when uh, I helped draft a, a speech that President Reagan gave about U.S.-Soviet relations uh, uh, that was uh, given actually a year before Gorbachev uh, came uh, into uh, the general secretaryship in the Soviet Union. And uh, the uh, what we did, we instead of we set forth uh, what we called a four part agenda of things that we wanted to do with the Soviet Union. Uh, one of these was to reduce arms. Uh, and uh, the, another uh, was to reduce our confrontation, military confrontation in third areas where we were backing uh, different uh, uh, factions uh, in uh, local wars. Uh, third, and one of the most important, was to improve human rights. And then uh, the fourth was to try to uh, break down the Iron Curtain and have more actually communication between our countries. Now, how do you phrase that? Do you say they've got to reduce their arms? They've got to stop interfering in foreign countries. They must respect more human rights. And by the way, uh, they, uh, uh, they need to uh, open up their country. That's not the way we put it. What we said is we must cooperate to achieve arms reduction. We must cooperate to withdraw from involvement in other people's wars. We must cooperate to improve human rights. We must cooperate to, um, uh, to improve our bilateral relationship. We didn't say tear down the Iron Curtain. Uh, we said, let's develop a better working relationship. In other words, and I think the word cooperation was used something like 30 times in that speech. When Secretary of State Schultz met the first time with Edward Shevardnadze, just after Gorbachev had named him foreign minister, he always started the meeting with a list of human rights cases in the Soviet Union, and he handed Shevardnadze that list, and Shevardnadze said, okay, I'll take this, but uh, tell me, can we talk about the status of women and blacks in the United States? And Schultz said, yes, of course. He said, I think we're making progress, but we've got ways to go, a way to go, and we can use all the help we can get. That was his attitude. So we made these issues. Um, we, it was not a matter of denying we have a problem or saying that uh, they, these were all equivalent. Uh, but And it was only two years later when the two of them met in New York. And Schultz always began his, uh, his presentation uh, with uh, a, a request for human rights. He gave Shevardnadze the list of refuseniks, political prisoners, and others. Shevardnadze took that. He looked up at uh, Schultz. They were on a first name basis by then. He said, George, I'll take this back to Moscow. And if what you say I can confirm, I'll do my best to correct it. Paused, and then he said, but I want you to know one thing. I'm not doing this because you asked me to. I'm doing this because it's what my country needs to do. Schultz stood up other side of the table, put out his hands. And as they shook hands, Schultz said, Edward, let me assure you, I will never ask you to do something that I do not think is in your country's interest. I had trouble keeping the tears back. I was at the table watching that. The Cold War was over for those two. So, you know, it depends on how you frame it. And today, uh, we say, well, <laughs> uh, Russia has, many, has invaded Ukraine. Well, yes, they have supported the separatists 
uh, in the Donbass. And but when the Russians say, "Well, who are you to achieve, uh, you know, to sanction us for that when you invaded Iraq?" Iraq had not attacked you, you had not approved it in the UN, you use false information, you're accusing us of belligerence? Quite frankly, I think they have a point. And I think this is not the, you know, whataboutism. But I think obviously the way to deal with it is to recognize that we're not perfect either. And as a matter of fact, if you be perfectly fair, we have more been more egregiously belligerent uh, than Russia has uh, over the past 20 years. Uh, and uh, one can talk about some of the things uh, individually, but it seems to me that uh, our our official line and that of many much of our media has been so one-sided. Uh, that we're simply unable to uh, see that there is another side and things are not quite, in fact, not nearly as simplistic as some of our charges are made. Thank you so much for that, Ambassador Matlock. Um, this has been such a rich and diverse conversation. I'm sure future generations of diplomats and scholars will benefit from it. I do want to turn to my last question for you today, if I may. Now, given all that we have discussed today, given all that you have experienced throughout your long career, what do you think it takes to set the US-Russia relationship on a fundamentally different trajectory? To return to the, the role of individuals, do you think this can only happen when the stars align again and we happen to have two individuals, two visionary leaders, another Reagan-Gorbachev kind of uh, combination in the White House and the Kremlin? Or is it indeed necessary that we relearn our history, that we converge on an interpretation, the West and the Russian side, on an interpretation of what went right and wrong uh, in the 1990s in order for us to move forward? And I want to come here to one quite amazing insight that you share in one of your books, and it really sort of stuck with me. You write in Autopsy of an Empire that, quote unquote, faithful convulsions in history have always produced a variety of interpretations. And then you cite World War I, the fall of the Roman Empire, the end of the Cold War. So do we really need to agree on the history of the relationship in order to chart a better path forward? I don't think we need to come to complete agreement uh, uh, to have a much, I would say, more productive relationship, a relationship that is much more in accord uh, with the true national interests of our peoples. And I don't think we need a different leadership to do it. We just need a different policies. First of all, we need to understand that the most important threats we face today, we both threat together. The pandemic, global warming, the breakdown of states and uh, the whole flow of refugees that comes from wars, but also from global warming and climate change. These are big issues. These are issues along, and then there's the matter of control of nuclear weapons, which is truly an existential issue for us both. This is so much more important than the sort of things we are now quarreling over, that we really need uh, leaders that will recognize that. And let's put things in perspective. And Uh, let's, you know, stop trying to run other people's business. Yes, human rights are important, but we may have different views of them. Uh, and uh, none of us are perfect. None of us have a system that necessarily is quite right for other people. 
we have to step back and understand that. So I would say if we had leaders that concentrated on the main things and kept the inevitable competitions peaceful, uh, that I think we could, uh, you know, we could, uh, with their current leadership, uh, do, um, uh, do a much better job. I think it has been really a shame uh, that with the pandemic, we haven't had more solidarity. Uh, obviously, we're not going to get that under control until it's under control everywhere. It's not only important to vaccinate our own people, we need to get other people vaccinated. And, and uh, therefore, I mean, uh, I think that, for example, uh, the government financed research for vaccines should result in uh, a sort of open technology uh, with, uh, so that you license without large charges, production anywhere, uh, and so on. I think there are a lot of things we could have been doing differently. Uh, and so that I think it, it's going to take a, a willingness to, to concentrate on the big issues which should unite us because it affects us all rather than these issues that divide us, most of which are not nearly as important as the bigger ones. Thank you for that. And thank you again, Ambassador Jack Matlock, for being with us today and sharing all your insights and expertise. Thank you for your very insightful questions.